Standby like use 2 through 33, sound 1A through 7 on deck. Standby Q actors. Electrics, kill the blue run lights, please. Like you 2 and sound 1A. Go. From Arizona Theater Company, this is Hang in Focus with your host, Sean Daniels. As someone that grew up in Arizona, it's a great way for us to share the work that we do worldwide. And featuring co-host Chanel Bragg. That is our responsibility, is to reflect what is going on in the world. Streaming live from the State Theater of Arizona. Let's do it. Let's really use this moment to re-envision our... Welcome to Hang in Focus Live with Sean Daniels. This is the new Arizona Theater Company. I'm just glad that you're here. On today's show, Sean sits down for a conversation with director, designer, playwright, Jared Mazashi, and with actor, writer, director, Robbie Tan. And hello and welcome everybody to the show. Thank you so much for coming along. Let's bring out Chanel Bragg, which is what everybody really tunes in for. Um, Get out of here. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Chanel, let's explain to everybody where where you are and are you a <laughs> member of the Rhythm Nation world going on wherever you are at this moment? You got a you got like a nineties headset there. I have a 90s headset going on. Um, I actually am really grateful to a lot of the different educational institutions around uh, the town um, that often ask Sean and I to both lecture or come in and critique. And so I was doing um, MTI critiques um, and the, the children were wonderful. They were so great, but I didn't have enough time to get home in time for the podcast. So here I am coming at you live from a closet somewhere. This <laughs> is a lot uh, th- of fun. Th- this is like uh, our old school theater ways. We're like, whatever yes. has to happen, where am I? Yeah. I mean, I would have done it in my car if my Wi-Fi signal was strong enough, but this is better. This is a better choice. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, all right. We have two guests today that I am d- thrilled about to be able to, to bring out and to get into some really exciting conversations. So uh, let's go ahead and bring them out. Our first guest is Jared Mazaki. So go ahead and come on hey. out. Hey, everybody. Hi, Jared. Yeah. Jared. And are we Hello. saying your, right, your last name right? Uh, Mizachi. So Mizachi. Mizachi. Yeah. Ah, yeah. It should it. be Mitsoki because that's Italian, but we butchered it here. So here it is. Mizachi. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. So, so one of the reasons I'm I'm so excited, I'm such a fan of Jared's work, and I'm so inspired by what he's done. Um, you know, for us here at Arizona Theater Company, we made the pivot early to start doing digital work because, I, actually, honestly, our impulse at the beginning was like we just have to talk to our subscribers and donors so that they won't abandon us during this time. And then we had this huge success, right? We had a concert in London that had 18,000 people tuned in and we did the 24 hour plays and 24,000 people tuned in. And Mm -hmm. um, overall it's about 300,000 views that we've gotten over the past year. Um, And our education program for each reading that we do, um, our last reading got 6,000 students in 70 schools all across the state in 72 hours, right? Which is amazing because we say we're the state theater but we perform in Tucson and Phoenix. And you know, if you've ever been to Arizona, there are more cities in Arizona than Tucson and Phoenix, right? So to be able to reach those places where if your school can't afford to come or it's too far by bus or you can't afford a bus, right? Suddenly we got all of the, all those people got to be a part of Brian Quijada's new musical that Reg Douglas directed that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise, right? So I feel like we're doing good, but we are not doing Jared work. Like that is the next <laughs> level above us. That is the like, you know, let's figure out really how not only is it accessibility, but how does the art form evolve? And that's why I'm excited to have Jared here to talk a little bit about it. So Jared, just for people at home that don't know who you are, can you give us just a brief, just a description of like who you are and and how did how did the last year go for you? Yeah, um, so hey everybody, it's really great to be here. And uh, yeah, I, I consider myself a multimedia creator. Uh, sometimes that means designing, uh, sometimes that means directing, sometimes that means writing. In the case of right now with someone else's house, the show I'm doing at Geffen, it also means acting. Uh, you know, I, I am a firm believer that multimedia performance making is the mirror held up to society right now where we have all of those gadgets in our pocket and we're using them mindlessly. Let's try and like use art to reflect that so that we can be more conscious users of the tools as opposed to being driven by them and being drug along by them. So um, so that's kind of always been my, my, uh, my career path. Uh, in the last year, 
you know, all of those things that I just said used to be a commodity. Uh, it used to be a choice inside the theater, uh, and suddenly it became a necessity. In order for us to get to our audiences, we have to use the thing that once was this choice. And um, I saw a lot of places that I was working with, as we all did, immediately the, the first instinct was let's shut down for health reasons. Um, and I suddenly realized, you know, there's a, a small group of us that have tools that, that really need to be out there and trying to share that information with people as much as possible because there are really intriguing ways to connect. And that's what my community has been doing for decades, how to connect using uh, uh, cameras, projectors, monitors, all of these things. So uh, I teach at University of Maryland. We were doing She Kills Monsters at the time. Uh, they were about to pull it. Um, and after after having that moment of let's pull it, I, I uh, had a conversation with some people saying, actually, we're a research one school. Here's the moment. Like, this is our industry moment. We should be doing research. So even if we fall on our face uh, in science, you know, experiments that show negative results are still a positive for the for their industry. So let's do that. That's our that's our purpose here. Um, like you just said, in our one night of performance, and my my key was, can we do it live? If that's my big thing, is what what how do we look at the strength of theater, which is liveness, and use these tools to pursue that uh, that type of platform? And uh, so we did it live, and in that one live event. Um, we had we had over 5,000 people and we had some of our students say this is the first time my parents got to see me act because they uh, live in South America or they live across the country and they've never been able to and uh, oh man I, there was just something about that that I was like this needs to continue and so for the whole year I've just been trying to iterate on that I've done uh, uh, pieces on zoom using Zoom as a TV switcher and mixing people live, which I did with Russian Troll Farm. Um, and then I designed that live. We had over 2,300 cues that all had 10 options. And as the show was going, I felt more like a conductor and the actors and I had a language together. So we would kind of cut it differently. Um, and and uh, now that's led me here to Geffen, which is a, 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 a one-man show, me telling a story about a family past that deals with a ghost story. And I'm alone in a house right now. Uh, it's completely empty. Here we go. Uh, and I tell a story. I'm in my 60, I think 65th performance tonight, live performance That's with so live cool. audience, um, telling telling the story. And it's, it's different every night. And there is connection with this audience. And there is a back and forth. And there is something to this. And it's not going to replace in person. I can't wait to get back in person. But there's definitely an additive quality here that when we do get back, Pandora's box is open and these are the tools, like I said, that are in our back pockets and uh, we we owe it to our viewers to, to really be looking at how we traverse the world with technology when we wield it for our purpose, not not invert. So that's kind of my, my uh, you know, what I've been investigating this whole year. It's been a thrill, it's been awesome, so. so so when you hear, right, all these theaters like us that are like, oh my God, uh, we had 300,000 people who were able to watch our work and be a part of. And then you hear other theaters be like, thank God that is over and we can get back to real theater, right? What what goes through your head in that moment? Um, well, I, I'm trying really hard to not uh, buy into the binary of it's one thing or the other, I think. Uh, you know, what I've been using as examples is, you know, I don't think the Greeks would be pissed at us for being indoors because they once were outdoors. Like, it's just another way to tell stories. And so, you know, when I hear a theater like your own saying 300,000 views, I want to know those people. I want to know why they clicked. I, I also, uh, and I know we've been talking and I've been talking to other theaters, those clicks are not the people who sit. And that's a whole other audience. And I, it, I want to encourage the theaters that have been pursuing it to not go back and just live stream from the balcony, but instead find new ways to tell stories so that it's not just extra nosebleed seats plus, it's that the people who are clicking get a unique view into storytelling 
and uh, and aren't aren't just put in the back of of, uh, of the theater. That there are multiple ways. I mean, we can sit in the theater and watch a proscenium while simultaneously an online viewership can be in the round. That's really exciting to me. Um, you know, and so that simultaneity, I think, is the way in which we can be creating an additive flavor to our return now. The we are back, we are, uh, thank God that's over. Um, I encourage those people who are saying that to find some grace in the fact that those who did pick up the tools during this year aren't doing it out of animosity towards the pre-COVID or post-COVID. We did it because this is a necessity to us. This has always been a necessity to us. Telling stories in multiple formats is is an iteration that I love. And uh, and so just to be careful with those words, because there is erasure happening when you say that we are back and nothing took place. A lot of things took place. And of those things that took place, there was more representation that was happening inside the artist telling stories than I have seen on stage. And there was more representation of the audiences who have never been able to get to the theater. So when we say the words, thank Thank God that's over. This is a placeholder. Uh, nothing happened. Flip those words around and state the names of the artists that did do stuff on digital performance and the names of those audience members who are finally able to view theater for the first time. Those are the placeholders that we're talking about. And that is very dangerous. So I, I, I want to encourage us that we just opened up a door to another series, another group of people that I actually believe are the people we are also talking about in our private conversations of how we get them in and widen our radius. There are solutions here. And if we can work together, I actually think this is a this is it. Like this is a great moment for all of us. So um, I can go on and on about that. And I, I don't want it to come from a source of anger. It's insp it's inspirational. It's like it is the things. It's it's the things. Like I'm so proud of the work that I have seen during this year. It has been hard and it has been exhausting. But people who said yes and deserve a seat at the table when we get back and they deserve to be heard and deserve to be celebrated and not to be feared. Um, it's a yes and environment. So I, all of those things are really thrilling to me. And I just hope that we can constantly, we can keep making that space for everybody. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, no, 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 it's great. You know, we did some digging into the numbers when we were having all these great numbers and we realized none of the people watching are our subscribers and donors, right? right. Like that they were, um, you know, they were happy. We got like an A for effort. They were glad we were doing something, but really like downloading an app on their phone or on their Apple TV was like, just not gonna happen, right? So we're reaching yeah. this entire new audience and I've been doing theater for a long time. And in the nineties, we had like 20 under 20. And then now we have like 40 under 40, right? Like we're still like trying to figure out like how to get people in. And suddenly we've done this thing that has gotten in thousands of people. Yeah. I mean, a, a great yeah. year for us, a great year for us is 20,000 people come to yeah. see yeah. the work that we do, right? And so when we did the 24 hour plays, we did that in one weekend. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I have to say it, again, the additive quality of that, I'm feeling as though people are hearing everything that you just said as an adversarial statement towards where we were and where we are headed. Now, yeah, there are comparisons in there, but I just encourage everyone to say, how do we incorporate all of those discoveries and how do we continue to evolve? Because what I learned, what I also learned is when everything shut down, how quick certain decisions had to have been made in order to sustain making work and how much of a gate opening that was to so many new artists and so many new ideas. So now I know that theater companies can do that switch when placed inside a pandemic. So let's try and do that without the pandemic because I know we can make that pivot when we need to. Um, and that shouldn't be driven just by money. It, it should be driven by the ideas. and the amount of conversations that took place during this pandemic that were about the idea as opposed to fitting a season because everyone was like, how do we even do this idea? We all need to believe in the idea. Those are the conversations that we should always have. Those are how, that's what should be driving us as an industry. So, and now we know we can. <laughs> so that's, that's why I, you know, like, as we get back, I can't really hear people being like, 
talking about the challenges of fitting that thing into the season. I just saw us all do that. So let's try and find a way to bring that back. And if the problem is actually the brick and mortar, all the more reason to have a second season of digital performance making. I completely agree. And one thing that you really touched on for me was the accessibility portion of it. The fact that we've reached so many people that we wouldn't have access to, the fact that if we need to understand, did it take COVID to recognize that not all people can get here via bus for a school field trip, or maybe on our senior living facilities, maybe they may not have it in their budget to have the correct amount of transportation to come to our matinees or anything like this. So by providing a streaming option, we're now actually allowing full accessibility to anybody that's interested in seeing our work. And that to me is important. And then of course, diversity as well. So a lot of theaters during this time have been like, oh, well shows that maybe I might not get away with doing during the season, I'm gonna do now. And so then you're seeing all this experimental work going on, but no, all what's happening is theaters are finally feeling that they're in a place where they can do this huge pivot to saying this is the type of programming that we also want to do. So there's a yeah. large influx of people of color being hired it first shows during this digital, um, you know, renaissance as well, which I think is incredibly important. Yeah, I would also add two things to add to that. One is we're not done with the accessibility um, uh, challenges. Like Wi-Fi still is an expensive infrastructure for certain people. And, and so I, I also, uh, that's what I keep coming up against is uh, I'm psyched about how much more accessibility. And I think now... Uh, being local, you know, some people are saying, well, the brick and mortar is important because you're getting into the community as well. And I think that's why both of these work. One has a certain struggle of accessibility of Wi-Fi finances, though that's significantly cheaper than getting five bus tickets to get to a place and then pay $100 for a ticket. Um, and so again, like, as people are listening to this, I just keep encouraging them to break down that binary. They're, this is all a process forward and we just made some big discoveries. Um, the second thing is really like, uh, I, I wish I wrote down exactly what you just said. The, like this is the show that we can get away with because of the situation. Like, oh man, those are, those are ammunition filled words, uh, you know, like, why does it take this to get away with the thing, you know? And if that's about a fear of, well, we're putting so much money into it, therefore we need to make sure that the work is, whoa, that's a path like, man, that's such a dangerous path. And I think that that's where this accessibility really runs deep is because you can lower the price point of everything while also putting a lot more money in the hands of the artist making the work um, the infrastructure for this ends up being a lot more of a step and repeat of the technology and therefore the designs of it and the people in the room are where you're investing your money. Um, all of those things are just, they're just really thrilling to me and, and it's a yes and. I just keep going back to the yes and. We can make both and we don't need to find ways to get away with something like 300,000 people sure is a statement about the things we didn't think we could get away with. That is more than the seats that you have. So that's a statement from the viewers. And I think that that's a, we got to listen to that and we've got to follow that, you know? I also want to, uh, something you brought up on, on Twitter that I think you just touched on now is pay equity uh, mm -hmm. amongst artists that are working on something, right? Because when we are inside a theater, we are driven by union agreements of what actors are, or what a director gets paid or what a designer gets paid, right? And it's all negotiated separately by different organizations. So it's really hard to get a level of <laughs> equity across the board. But when we went to digital, I know for us inside, we were like, what, what do we pay people? And so we just made the decision that we paid everybody $100 a day. No, it didn't matter what you did, everybody made the same. And it was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's like, what What are the things that stop us, I guess, union agreements, to be able to bring everybody onto the same page so that everybody that's working on a project feels like we're all invested in this together. And I don't know that I have to work twice as long, but I make half as much as the person mm -hmm. sitting over there. So can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a really, uh, it actually opened my eyes up during this time period for the exact reasons that you experience. I've never been, I've been brought into a few projects where they're like this, here's the lump sum of money that we can put into the project. How do you, how do we, the team that is in the room, how do we use that money? 
whoa, that's a great conversation to be having with the artist as opposed to just being like, here's what you get, here's what you get. So that was one thing. And that was equity of, of labor, of resources. And then we could all make a, a joint decision about how that money was going to be used. That was amazing, first of all, and a first. The second is it has made me realize that everyone's contract and for those who follow me on Twitter, this is going to be redundant, but it's it's a thing that I'm I can't get over. You know, designers have a fee; they get paid in thirds. A director has a fee; they get paid in their thirds or however the agreement is. You then have uh, board ops who are paid hourly or daily. You then have uh, stage managers and actors weekly. You have everybody paid on different time periods. And as we're having this conversation about ten out of twelves as it, putting my designer hat on, it's a very difficult conversation to have that I'm trying to uh, navigate because actually the first step, I, I, I agree with all of the reasons that we need to we need to take that down a notch and not, not be looking at making work with 10 out of 12s. The, the secondary problem to that though, is the fact that 10 out of 12s in my contract actually signifies nothing because I'm not on an hourly. I just have to get the idea done. And so when we are in second tech realizing that we need an extra day, everyone's having a conversation in that production meeting and that production meeting is going extra long because we're talking about those who are on hourly, weekly, extra, overtime, all of that, which is not me. I just have to get the idea done. So adding that extra day doesn't give me any extra financial support to make the thing happen. And it does, it is great for others. So the inequity of that contractual agreement, I think really needs to be looked at so that we can all say, this is why we need an extra day because everyone's actually coded in why they want the extra day or why they don't having to do with art or finances. And I think the system puts our, our artists against each other. And uh, that's all out the window when you're like, he, let's just make sure everyone's, you know, having everyone get paid a hundred dollars a day, for instance, um, by adding an extra day, everybody is, equitable <laughs> like yeah. that that's like a no brainer you know it, just to say that out loud is like yeah that's a no brainer but when we go back into all of these different contracts it gets so muddy so quickly and suddenly you have a begrudging designer being like oh, i just want to get it done can i just do it like can we do it now no we have to do the extra and the board op is like great i'll totally take that extra pay you know and all of that is just we got to look at that because we have to figure out how we're all theater artists making the work and uh, as opposed to all of these different things, because that's where it gets coded, muddy, really complicated. And um, and and so it's kind of a two way street of everything that you're saying about equity, making sure that everyone's about the idea. But there's also all these contracts. And, you know, I've been asking on, on Twitter a lot of questions about do we call it theater? Or do we call it digital performance? Because when we call it theater, the unions put the flag on it, and suddenly it's a it's a very um, you know con complicated thing uh, to figure out. So um, when it isn't, then we can make it however we want, and then license it to a theater, and that's a very different thing. So you know, I, I think we have, there's a huge there's a huge conversation there to have. So what what's what's the future? What's Jared's hope for the future of how this all goes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I actually, I'm, I'm talking to a few theaters right now of being a consultant for digital strategies. Um, and I have asked that I intersect with their consultants in EDI because I actually think it's the same conversation in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that adding tech into the conversation of accessibility and diversity and representation actually shouldn't be separated. And if we do separate it, we might all of a sudden end up 10 years from now being artist against artist. Like we need to do this together. And, um, and so that I think is, is where I want to put all of my effort is really trying to help figure that out and really find a way so that when that child who turns on their, their monitor to see something isn't sitting in the furthest seat back watching something barely audible, but that they're getting a totally unique experience. So um, that's where I want to be asking the questions and also just iterating on this. This is, we've been doing this for 50 years and, and this really cracked it open. So how can we take these tools and awareness and take advantage of that to create momentum forward? Uh, I want us to be performing on the moon within the next 10 years. So that's my, that's my goal. Cause then, you know, South America, uh, you know, westernmost Australia while you're sitting in New York City, like suddenly stages become really exciting. And I, there's no word of placeholder anywhere in that sentence. So, yeah. 
That's great. <laughs> That is amazing. Well, every show we have a word that we ask our um, guests to leave us with. It's a word that signifies where you are in this moment um, and what you think about the future. And so as you go into this performance that you're going into tonight, and of course, with all the wonderful things and perspectives that you shared today, what's a word that resonates with you at this time? Uh, it's a hyphenated word, so it sounds like two, but I think open source would be my word. Mm -hmm. Uh, open good. the door. Let's not be gatekeepers. Let's open source everything. Share with each other. Open source. I love right. it's our first hyphenated word, Sean. <laughs> we know this for I'm 15 a, months. I'm a, I'm a, it's our first, yeah. <laughs> I'm a hyphenated artist. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, if people want to follow more of you and your yes. conversation, yeah, what's your, your Twitter handle? And we'll, we'll throw it up. It's, and it's just my name, and I switched it on Instagram because people were asking to. So it's just Jer uh, at Jared Mazzacci, all one word. Great. On both uh, Instagram, and but Twitter, your... Twitter's where Twitter's where it's at. And yeah. seeing your show, how can people see your show that you're doing? It, it unfortunately closes tomorrow night, and it's it's uh, it's already oh, wow. closed. The the tickets, yeah, have already been have already been closed. However. There are conversations about uh, an iteration of it in the coming months. Uh, it is a ghost story, and there is a month coming up that seems pretty uh, applicable to that. So uh, keep 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 on Twitter, and and uh, uh, you know I'll, I'll hopefully make some sort of announcement as we as we inch towards yeah. that. I gotta yeah. say, it's such a good show. You you know, Thanks, and it was man. sold out. I had to pull like all my horrible <laughs> industry contacts to be like, somebody at the Geffen like uh, get me in. Um, and yeah, and so you get like a box mailed to you. It arrives. You open it up while you're watching. Things are going on. I mean, it was really we. My wife and I loved it, so it was fantastic. And actually, Thanks, we have Sean. friends. We have friends that you snuck in for tonight. Oh, great. Oh, right, 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 right. Right, that's right, that you hooked yeah. us up, so we get, you know. Listen, anyone who's watching, yeah, just uh, contact, you know, see, we'll see what we can do. Uh, it's great to, it's great to perform for people and tell stories and, and remind people that connection can happen digitally. Uh, it's really thrilling, so thanks, Sean. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for coming on here and sharing your brilliance. And uh, when you're on the moon, we want you to come back and and do yeah, be our first guest from the moon. It'll, it'll be called a it'll be called a moon happening, so that then you can license it, and we don't have to worry about all these. There problems. we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Chanel, it's really nice to meet you. It's too. nice meeting you yeah. too, Jared. Okay. Take care, y'all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. That is the coolest. I can't wait now for the moon, the moon show. I know, I know. Now we have to keep this show going for <laughs> another 10 years to be. Of course. Able. Yeah. Um, hey, so let's bring out our next guest who is yes. like a big fancy HBO star. Right. Um, let's bring out Robbie Tan to the show. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How's it going? That was an amazing conversation, by the way. Wow. That was exciting <laughs> to hear like theater being talked about with that kind of verb and passion and excitement. I mean, like, I feel privileged just to have listened to that. So thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> thank you, Robbie. <laughs> Um, so Robbie, you are, you are, uh, you're like on the hottest show that's on TV right yes. now, right? You're on American <laughs> Town. Yes, I am. I am. I was on the show. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Hey, c just walk me through or walk any of us through how, how that happens to an actor, right? You're, you're auditioning. How do you end up suddenly in the middle of a, an HBO hit show? That's that's a great question. Um, I think like the important thing to know about that is that casting director who cast me in that show, that was probably about 10 years of cultivating that relationship in the first place, right? So wow. in, in, my, in, in my early career, when I first came to New York, when I had done no TV and film, when I probably had no business doing any TV and film, I was just like, let me take a shot doing this. You know, she brought me in. Her name's Avi Kaufman, and she just gave me some notes and said, "Hey, this is really kind of like what I think you kind of need to work on, right? Like, I, and if I bring you back, I kind of want to see these these notes Im uh, implemented." And so, year after year, I'm telling you, she would bring me back into the room, have me audition for stuff. And every time I could feel her being a little bit more like, all right, you're kind of getting the hang of this. You're kind of getting the hang of this. And uh, eventually, you know, I auditioned 
you know, in 2019 for Mayor of Town. And after all of the auditions I, you know, had, and after all the other auditions I've had for a, a bunch of other stuff, you know, where there's like multiple callbacks and, you know, there's like seven times you're meeting with people in a room. Uh, it was one audition. I went in one time and then like three weeks later they were like, yeah, you got the part now. And, and which That's was so the cool. weirdest thing because, you know, the biggest job I've ever gotten was like the least amount of auditioning that I've ever done for that job. So uh, th that's pretty much how 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 it how it came to be. But I mean, like it was it was a process that you know uh, took years of cultivating that relationship and that casting director being generous enough to say, "Hey, I see you have something, but maybe it's not you know refined yet. Maybe it's not ready to go." Um, then eventually give me a chance to do something that I was right for. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's how I got it, man. That's great. That's great. So I, I have to tell everybody, Robbie Tan has always, always been one of my favorite actors. We, oh. we did a show like a, a give or take 4,000 years ago at, at that <laughs> Humana festival. Um, and we have some pictures from it here oh, that yes. we are going we to share. Yeah. So yes. All right, so yes. go, yeah, go, go ahead and play the play this clip so that we can see Robbie in action here. Um, so the just to explain what's happening here, so this was like a site specific, like the audience was walking through and a heist happened, right? And then they had to get split up into like various rooms and they learned things, but because it's it was so many people. The, the the show itself would break down sometimes, like too many people would be in one room and then not in another. And so our fail safe was like, when in doubt, send all your people to Robbie. So like <laughs> if, if ever audience members got lost, we would send them to Robbie. And then, yeah, this is this is this is baby Robbie Tan here. And it was his Incredible. it was his job to not only entertain them, but to like sometimes improvise and stall for minutes and minutes while another room got ready so that we could then move them through. And you, and you, were, and you were brilliant. You were brilliant at it. Yeah. Oh, thank you, man. Well, well, I have to say one of the, just hearing you uh, uh, talk in that last conversation and both of you, but hearing you talk in the last conversation and now remembering the show, I mean, one of the things I've always loved about you, Sean, is like, you always push the envelope in the best way. Like you are always like this show could have very, this for the apprentices could have very easily been like, we do some scenes, we write some like nice, you know, simple stuff. You stage it like on stage. No, this was like one of the most elaborate and fun shows I've ever been a part of. I mean, like you threw us into the fire and I, I, I had a blast <laughs> with, like just see, he would just penguin. This penguin yeah. holding the thing with a with what is strap. This? Can so you this, please explain this? Because I'm so trying this, to understand. So amazingly enough, this uh, so this penguin actually is in my kitchen. I could go get it uh, <laughs> and bring it in because part of the plot of the show was that right. It, this took place in 21C in Louisville, and they have red penguins all through it. But one of them was a fake that Russians had put there. So at this point in the show, I believe you've like strapped a bomb to it and you're trying to save everybody in the building because yes, you're gonna yes. rush out and toss yourself in the river. Um, yes. But what's amazing in this picture, which is true, is like that audience, this is clearly pre-COVID, that audience is like next to you. I mean, you are literally <laughs> acting and, and there's like this woman clearly just who's like seconds away from you as you're having this dramatic moment. <laughs> yes, yes. And that's Dan, who I think is playing my son at the time. That's like, right. That's right. Yeah. I think I'm saying goodbye to him as like a love farewell. I'm gonna go sacrifice myself. But yeah, that was that was that was that was oh my gosh, man. I mean, we we had a blast working on that. I just remember laughing all the time and engaging in the audience in that way. I truly never had the opportunity to do something like that since. And that's yeah. kind of a shame. <laughs> this is an artist rendering of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was animation, right? There was like we did like uh, voiceovers and stuff. Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, there was one room you went in that had like a cartoon backstory, and that you know we tried to have different mediums um, in it. But yeah, but I just remember like even you were young. Are at that time, you know, you were in your early twenties, and and the answer was always like, all right, if the show's not working, send them to Robbie, right? Like Robbie will hold them. <laughs> Robbie will take care of them 
and then at some point they'll come back. So uh, like when when you you know were suddenly on HBO on my screen, I was like, oh, of course. That's like, <laughs> of course, that's the one that continues on and on. Well, that's kind of you to say. I had probably too much confidence back then to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to think that I actually pulled some of that. Uh, yeah, that, that was a blast. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we are so privileged uh, that we actually have a clip of your brilliant work on Mayor of Easttown that we would love to show our um, subscribers and our patrons to kind of get a little deeper look at your beautiful acting chops. So please turn oh, off oh, your good. yeah. Oh. Let's turn off our cameras yeah. and our mute ourselves for a second. Aaron even lived with Billy for a little while. When did she live with you? Bill? Oh, uh, <clears throat> God, that was like uh, three years ago, at least. What did she move in for? Well, her mother just died. and you know, Kenny was drinking a lot, I think. And you know, we didn't want her around that. So I asked her to come stay with me, and I fixed her up a room in the basement. And how long did she stay? Three weeks, maybe. It was a little longer than that, wasn't it? I thought it was at least a couple months she was with you. <laughs> I really don't remember. It was a long time ago. Yeah, I gotta get going. Where are you going? Uh, Maddie's having that fundraiser for his daughter at the Duffers. You know, I told him I'd stop by. Have a good night. See you later. Bye, Bill. Have fun. Thanks, I will. Bye. Oh my God, he left a full beer behind. <laughs> Nobody, Nobody does, does that. that. Nobody does no. that. No, what does Nobody that mean? Does yeah. that. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. It made me want to watch it. I want to know more about it. I haven't seen. Oh the show yeah. Yet. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's a. Well, it's a seven hours, so it's a pretty quick watch. But you know, you might save it for like a. Well, it's raining here. Is it? Is, it's like a. Is, is it raining there as well? I think I read a comment that said that. In Tucson, it is not in Phoenix, but in Tucson, oh, gotcha. there's been some flash floods. So shout out to our Tucson friends. Stay safe right. during monsoon season. <laughs> um, was uh, what was it like being on set? I mean, I'm just like it's a it's a high profile set, right? It's probably shrouded in secrecy a bit at the moment. What what was that experience like? I mean, it was. Um, you know, I've always, every time I've watched stuff on TV, I've always watched, like, things that I've really loved. I've always been like, I just want to be a small part of that show. And I think for me, uh, HBO, you know, Kate Winslet, the script, the part, uh, was a dream come true the whole time. And there, there, was, a, there was also a fundamental difference between, because uh, the show got broken up by COVID. Like, we shot the first half pre-COVID, COVID happened, wow. we had a six month break, and then we came back to the show after COVID. Uh, and that, COVID wasn't done, but uh, we can't, obviously we had that long break. So it was a, kind of a tale of two different versions on set for me. The first half was, I was very uh, excited, but nervous. Like I was kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, it, because it was a huge opportunity, I was like, they're gonna fire me. Like they're gonna fire me at any point. Like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be cut from this show and they're going to fire me. It's gonna be done. And uh, once COVID, you know, happened, and I, I think this happened for a lot of people, like everybody's lives got upended and, you know, the boss people, lost people personally my perspective on everything shifted. My perspective on my career shifted. My perspective on the importance ultimately of the work in sort of like a holistic way shifted. So when I came back, it was way more of a feeling like this may never happen again. Like I could lose this at any moment. And that the second half of it, I wished that I felt that way in a lot of ways in the first half which was, I was, I, I, I felt such a deep sense of gratitude and like, I didn't want to, uh, t not savor every single moment. And not that I've ever been ungrateful for working in the past, but I think as an actor, you sort of have to have this 
sometimes detached attitude with um, the work that you do because it's so up and down all the time that it's hard to invest in when things are great because when they're not great, suddenly it hurts badly. <laughs> but in this way, I was like, you know what? I learned I can really, it can feel good when I'm working on something. I can be grateful for it as I'm working on it. I can, and, and I didn't feel as much pressure, frankly. I was like, if I get fired, who cares? Like horrible things are happening in the world right now. This is such a small thing and I'm just kind of grateful to still be here. But the show itself, I mean, it was a dream come true. It, it's, it's, it's the kind of show that I love. It's the, uh, uh, a level of, uh, fellow actor that I, you know, am just it helped me raise my game tremendously. Obviously I learned a lot and in a big way, it was like, you know, felt good to be in that league and go, can I hang in this league? Which was something pretty, yeah. pretty exciting. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I, it was a dream come true for me in, in, in all the ways. I mean, it's HBO, it's everything I've wanted to really do before, you know, in my career. So check that one off the box for me. You know, I, I love, but I love what you're saying for those of us that are artists that you really think it was 10 years of working with this casting director to get cast to suddenly be an overnight success, right? For And it's just like, that's what I think so often people don't see for us as artists is like the, the, the years it takes, the craft, the working, the making connections. Um, that that often when you're often when you're in the middle of it, it's easy to feel lost, right? It's easy to feel like I'm not even sure where this is going or how this is going, and um, yeah. you know, only in yeah. retrospect. Absolutely, and 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 really, I mean, I have to say that I I TV and film acting. I came from theater. I've done theater, you know, my whole life. Theater's something I've loved to do. So the adjustment to do something uh, in, in on TV and film has not been. It was not a smooth adjustment. It took me, it took me when I, you know, five, six years ago when I said, you know, I'm going to make a conscious effort to do this. Um, it's taken me all that time to get to a point where I feel like I've gotten good enough to do something like this. Right. So mm -hmm. I, it's like, I couldn't have done it three years ago. I couldn't have done it two years ago, you know, because I wasn't ready. So it's kind of uh -huh. this moment where I've, felt like I put it together enough to, to meet the moment enough to not look like an idiot. Right. Like, uh, so, so, uh, uh, but I absolutely, it's true. You know, like it, it takes a long time and that we kind of get caught up, especially as actors, you know, somebody graduates out of college and they hit it big immediately. And you're like, well, that didn't happen for me. So, you know, what's, what's wrong with, what's wrong with me. Um, but that it's a long game. Right. In, in all creative endeavors, uh, it's about who's there at the end, who go, in the marathon of it all and the day to day grind of getting better and failing a lot and kicking yourself back up and taking hits and picking yourself back up. I mean, it sounds um, cliche and yet it's not. It, it really is the reality of it all. I think that's oh, sorry. I, I think that's so beautiful, though, um, fellow actor to actor. Um, because I think that you don't recognize that all of the little pit stops along the way on your journey are actually what prepared you for this opportunity. Right. And when you get that opportunity, then you look back and say, oh, that's why I had the interaction. That's why I said yes to that gig that I just really didn't want to do. But that helped me network and meet someone that put me in a gig that actually taught me the skill to do yeah. this. Like everything happens for a reason truly like i'm not a big fan of music man i think everybody knows that but that, <laughs> that is how my introduction to atc began was through that right. show a show i said i would be caught dead auditioning for <laughs> but <laughs> now the truth comes out um but i was like you know what i need to go beyond my comfort zone and although i like more contemporary musicals i was like you know what let's let's give music man a try and it honestly has changed my life because now here I am. So every yeah. every decision that you make has has a some sort of effect afterward, and it's all preparing you for where you're going. And I'm so grateful that now that culminated to this for you, and I'm excited for what your next thing is. Well, thank you, and that's that's beautifully said. I mean, like you really just you just don't know, 
and the things that make you uncomfortable sometimes. I think that that that's re- I mean that's really well said. Is like a, a, a lot of the time now it's hard because a lot of the things that I you know projects that I wasn't necessarily you know super excited about and I struggled through and slogged through like I took something out of it you know and that's a really important thing to remember as a as a as an artist that there's real value in that so that's that's well said um oh Kara Dad's Fitch says, hey, Robbie, big fan of yours. Hey, yeah. hey, yes, yes. One of my favorites. Um, so wait, so what's, it, what's next for you? What, like, what, what does one do after you are in a hit HBO show? <laughs> like, do you, do you just yeah. go back to auditioning? Do you strut around town? Like, how, like, what do you do? It comes out, everybody loves it. Does your life change at all? I've been going on a lot of long walks, just trying to, you know, make sure people see me, you know, no, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's, uh, that's, that's been the, 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 the interesting part about it, you know, is like what, what I think is different. I mean, very different than theater, uh, which I've, which again, which is where I've come from more, what I'm so used to is like, there's the immediacy of it in theater, right? Like there's the show, you're doing the show, you get the applause, you go home, you go to sleep, you wake up the next day, you do the show. It, it's a it's a weird thing because I actually finished the show in December, right? Mm-hmm. So I've actually been done with this thing for, you know, five, six months. <clears throat> and I was teaching all throughout, uh, you know, uh, the fall and the spring. So there's like two, two like worlds that are existing right now for me. One is the world of the show, which is like, people are now watching for the first time and it's exciting and people are getting into it. And it's like, and then there's my real life. There's like my day to day life, which is like the week that I think, you know, some of the big episodes for me were airing. Uh, I was like, am I going to qualify for my insurance this year? Like <laughs> there were like very real things going on in my life, you know, that were not glamorous and had nothing to do with the show at all. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm auditioning. I, you know, it's it's been helpful in terms of getting some uh, attention in terms of aud- things that I've been able to audition for now. But I'm very much just back to my life, which is kind of the the interesting thing about it. It's not it's not directly in line with my day to day life in any right. substantive way, which I I have found to be uh, just interesting and, and, and not confusing confusing is the wrong word, but it's just, it's like, it's over there. It's like, it's all happening over there for me. You know what? It's interesting. I think that is in many ways, often like the director experience, right? Because if you direct out of town, the weirdest thing that happens is you go to opening night uh, and then you get up the next morning and you fly home and then suddenly you're back in your apartment and then like, (laughs) And you're like, life goes on. And then two weeks later, everyone's like, oh my God, this review came out. And you're like, oh, that's right. Like that, that, you know, as an actor, you have this whole second life of running the show, right? And you right. form cast and, and it's just like, and as a director, you're not a part of that, right? You're on to the next thing. And you, um, it's, we, it is weird to be like, oh yeah, back there is still that thing that we made that has a whole life unto itself. Right. And some nights are better yeah. and some nights are worse. And um Oh my God, this person sprained an ankle and their understudy went on. And you're like, <laughs> right. from afar, you're like, okay, great. You know, yeah, it's like, right, I'm glad right. that it happened, but I'm on to yeah. the next thing. It's a, it's a weird disassociation that happens, I think, for directors. Yeah. When the catharsis of it is not the same. That sounds exact. I didn't, I didn't make that connection, but that sounds exactly right. But, and that's what it is really for actors in TV and film. We're much more on the creative team in that way. Like we're involved in the making of it then we don't get it, we're not involved in the editing of it. I didn't think of it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. So what, do you know what's next for you? Are you acting on anything I, coming up? I have no idea, man. I am, I am unemployed and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Robbie, you are so fantastic in the show. We ate it up. We watched it in like three days and, um, and actually, you know, it's amazing. I posted that you were coming and the number of people that were in your apprentice class that were like, oh my God, that's Robbie Tan. Like somehow they had watched the show. They had loved <laughs> it, 
they had, yeah. <laughs> shout out to Nancy Noto who wrote me and was just like, oh my God, that's it. Like you were transformative in it, right? It, you didn't oh, look yeah. like all of our friend Robbie. You were just right, like, right, oh, right. that's a mysterious guy that doesn't finish his beers. I don't know what's going on with him. <laughs> you know? What's wrong with that guy, man? There's something <laughs> weird going on there, yeah. Well, no, and, thank you very much, I appreciate it. And Sorry. our stage manager and digital producer, Alex also watched the show. So Alex was able to like get me up to speed too. So I'll be checking it out this weekend. Nice, awesome. Well, I hope you enjoy it, and and thank you so much for for having me. It's been uh, awesome to to reconnect with you, Sean, and, and meet you, Chanel, and, and and see what you're doing. It's, it seems incredible, and I expect nothing less from you, Sean. You're you've always mutually been one of my favorites. So, thank you for having me. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for doing this. Thank you for coming on the show, um, yeah. and I'm excited for the next Robbie Tan success. We oh, we do. got the word. I forgot about the word. Yeah, okay. I know. I always, I always do. What's Does you? My I just saw. Finger go up. I know. I know. I so as soon as it starts. So before we go, so as you saw before, we asked Jared, "What's a word that we that we feel like is where he's living today?" What is that word for you? Oh, that's such a good question. I think, I think uh, empathy is a good one mm. for me. Yeah. And what? And why do you say empathy? Yeah. Can you give us a little more? I think it's an important thing to practice in this day and age is to empathize with people and to really try to uh, see the world through other people's eyes and not just like a uh, an outside way, but try to get inside their their perspective. That's so em empathy. I, yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. And that's the ultimate Perfect. actor job, right? Yes. Yes. I guess that's in line with the actor. The actor job, yes. <laughs> That's great. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robbie, for coming on the show. Of course. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for those fun pictures. <laughs> yeah, I know. Marketing had fun with those. <laughs> um, all right. Do you want to take us through our tribute here? We're doing it at the end, Chanel. I will. I will. So we here at Arizona Theater Company have been graced with the presence of Taj Oates. Taz was our um, assistant production manager, I believe, for the last five years. Something like that. Yeah, Long, longer than both you and I, yeah. Well, yeah, longer than Sean and I, and has been a wonderful staple here at Arizona Theater Company. Um, really have implemented some great things like our dive-in committee, um, really being in terms of EDI and the importance of that, like Taj has been, you know, first and foremost, like here's our land acknowledgement statement. And like, I've just been really grateful for him. Um, but he is now moving on uh, to other pastures. We're very proud of him and this new um, appointment with the Alley Theater in Texas. And so we want to send him out with a little bit of love. So here is uh, Taj's goodbye. And then after that, we'll be followed up by a call board. And Sean and I will see you next week. Great. Thank you, everybody. Smart. The word I think about when I think about Taj is insightful. Uh, I love our conversations that we have about how to make ATC better and then how to make the theater industry as a whole better. I know he's gonna go on to great things, so congratulations. Todd, you are so incredible. We are so absolutely proud of you. So my word for you is ready, honey, because they are ready for you over there at the Alley Theater. I love you. Break a leg. Mwah. Passion. Good luck, Taj. We'll miss you. Taj is lovable. We'll miss you, bud. Dependable. ATC won't be the same without you, Taj. We're gonna miss you. One of the things I'm always grateful about Taj is that right before I got here, the majority of the production department had left. And so when I arrived and I brought Becky in, Taj also, he stayed at a time that he really could have left and made sure that not only was there a peaceful transfer of power, but that the artists that we had already been committed to were taken care of, that the productions were taken care of, that Becky, our production manager, and I were set up for success. And to make sure that we got through from one artistic director to the next. So really at this point, you know, we have a very calm, well-organized, inspired 
production staff, and a lot of that is due to Taj, who made sure that we got through a tough moment to the other side. So for that, I will always be grateful. your call board for July 2nd to July 8th, 2021. Hi, I'm assistant digital producer, Alex Hollis, and thank you so much for joining us today where Sean sat down with Jared Masashi and Robbie Tan. Be sure to join us next Friday, July 9th at 4 p.m. Arizona time for another exciting guest on Hang and Focus Live. We're going to head over to the Giving Corner and see what development has for us this week. Hi everyone, this is Carly Preston, your Director of Annual Fund and Stewardship at ATC. Uh, we have a very special Giving Corner. This Giving Corner, we want to give a huge, huge thank you to APS, um, who is making it possible uh, for our student at Mays of Title I school students up in Phoenix, Arizona. They are great community leaders, volunteering um, several hours every year and giving throughout the community. And it's because of supporters like APS that we can have over 15,000 students engage with us in our student matinees um, with our learning and education department. And on a personal note, I was one of the very lucky students uh, in high school that got to go to the student matinee series here at ATC. And it really does change your life. Um, I just, I have very distinct memories of going and seeing shows with all of my friends. And it's really wonderful that we are able to provide this and it is organizations like APS that allow us to do so. So thank you so very much for your support. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, please tell a friend, pass it along, like us on Facebook and Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, ring that bell so you can be notified when we air live and to see our latest content. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you next.